All right, we're going to go to Acts chapter 13 when you get a chance to uh, find a spot to sit. Acts chapter 13. Here's where we've been. We've been talking about the story of what happened after Easter. After Easter, Jesus appears to his disciples. He is really alive. He's risen from the dead. He proves it uh, by, the Bible says, many infallible proofs. There's no way they could argue. He was with them. They touched him. They saw him. He ate with them. Uh, They didn't believe it at first that he was alive. And he said, do you have anything to eat? And they gave him some fish, some broiled fish. And he ate the broiled fish. You're like, see? See? He's proving that he was definitely real and alive. And so after he appears to them, he appears to them for a period of 40 days. He's with them. He cooks with them. He talks with them and teaches them many things, the Bible says, about the kingdom of God. And then on the 40th, around the 40th day after Easter, he ascends back to heaven And after he ascends back to heaven, or as he ascends back to heaven, he says to them that he has given them a commission to go and preach the gospel to all the world. But he said, wait at Jerusalem. Do not leave Jerusalem. Wait, because I am sending you the promise of the Father. I'm sending you a gift that you're going to need. So they go back to Jerusalem. After Jesus ascends into heaven, they go back to Jerusalem and for 10 days they seek God. They are hungry for him. They want this gift, the promise of the Father. Jesus said, you will be clothed with power from on high when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And they they say, we've got to have this power. Jesus had the power. Jesus was able to, to accomplish and do many things and preach many things and We need that power if we're going to spread the news about him. And so they wait and they seek for 10 days. And on Pentecost Sunday, they they gather together, they're praying together, and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit is poured out on the church for the very first time. 120 believers, about 120, gathered, scared to death, no influence, no real money to speak of in that group, not a very powerful or influential group of people at all. In fact, the core of them were kind of blue-collar, out-of-work fishermen. That, that's really what Peter, he left his fishing nets to follow Jesus. He's just a hard, uh, hard uh, living, foul mouthed fisherman. And then he leaves all of that and says, that when Jesus says, Come and follow me, he leaves and does that. Andrew and James and John, same thing. They were fishermen. They all come and they follow Jesus. So this group of 120 people, how in the world would you expect that they would accomplish anything? They don't, it's not like they have the internet. It's not like they have any real technological tools. It's not like they have a lot of political clout or a lot of money in the bank. How do you expect they're going to be able to accomplish anything? But you look at what they did through the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, money and marketing and all the tools of this world cannot change a heart. And if you cannot change a heart, you cannot change a community. And if you cannot change a community, you cannot change a city. And if you cannot change a city, you cannot change a culture. And if you cannot change a culture, you cannot change the world. So it all comes back to the power of the Holy Spirit to change a human heart. All of it comes back to that point right there. And that's exactly what happens. They go out, Peter starts preaching, and 3,000 people are saved that day. Now that's an abnormal, huge occurrence. It doesn't happen like that every day. But you know what? Not that long afterwards, all of a sudden, there is this, there is another powerful moment in Acts chapter 3. Peter heals this man who is lame at the, beside the gate of the temple. Many, many people see it. He is running and 
shouting and jumping and praising God. And people are so amazed. Peter stands up, he preaches, and a bunch more people get saved. And by this time, it's five or 10,000 Christians in Jerusalem. And the Bible says that the Lord was adding daily to them those who were being saved. Amazing, amazing story. Amazing power that is there. You see, they had two things. Two things. They had boldness to speak for Jesus and power to back it up. They had boldness to speak for Jesus and power to back it up. And that is what happens over and over and over again. You can't shut these people up. You can't make them be quiet. You can't threaten them. You can't even persecute them into shutting up. They are bold to speak for Jesus and they've got power to back it up. So all kinds of miracles and incredible things are happening. And we've gotten all the way up through the little journey that they've been on in Acts. Uh, through the, the early chapters of Acts where uh, there's finally persecution arises and there's a guy named Saul and this Saul who later changes his name to Paul, you might have heard of him. Saul is making havoc of the church. He's killing Christians and all of a sudden somebody's praying for him apparently because Jesus knocks him off of his donkey on his way to kill more Christians. Knocks him on the ground. Blinds him with the glory of his presence and says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul says, who are you, Lord? That's what you say when somebody knocks you right off your donkey. You say, who are you, Lord? And what do you want me to do? And he says, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. Get up, go into the city. I've got something for you. So he gets up. He goes into the city. He's blinded by this light. And for three days and three nights, he will not eat. All he will do is pray. Finally, a man named Ananias comes, a Christian believer. Jesus comes to Ananias and says, go, there's a man named Saul. He's praying. Ananias is scared to death because he's heard about Saul. Oh yeah, Christian killer Saul. I know that guy. He goes finally at, at Jesus' urging. He goes, lays his hands on Saul. His blindness is healed and he is saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. And he keeps the tradition going. All of a sudden, he is full of God. He's got boldness to speak and power to back it up. Now here's where we stand in Acts chapter 13. Paul, Saul, and Paul, Paul Saul, I keep mixing their names up. Saul becomes the most powerful Christian missionary of his day. In fact, in Acts chapter 13, we read this. In the church at Antioch, this is where Paul kind of bases his ministry out of. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. And it lists several of them. And the last one is Saul. And it says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, so they're praying, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have called to them. When you're needing direction about what's next, the thing to do is go to God and pray. If you're really deeply concerned about what's next, fasting and praying is always a good plan. And so he's fasting, they're praying, and God says, here's what's next. I've got a mission for Barnabas and Saul. I want them to go, and I want them to, to go, and they're going to be preachers of the gospel to the Greek-speaking world. And that's exactly what happens. Look, the two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogue, synagogues, and John, John, John Mark, was with them as their helper. And they traveled through the whole island as the, until they came to Paphos, and there they met a Jewish sorcerer and a false prophet named Bargesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul. Sergius Paulus. And the proconsul was an intelligent man sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas the sorcerer, for that's what his name means, his, when he, the, the, the word his name meant sorcerer. So he's a man who is deeply spiritual but not Christian, right? Because a lot of people who are spiritual but not Christian are into eclectic spirituality. Oh, I just take from whatever spiritual source of power I can find. And that's not the Christian 
thing because there's only two sources of spiritual power, God and Satan, right? But he says, he says he's a sorcerer and he says he tried to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So while Paul is preaching to this high-ranking government official, governor in this area, this influential, spiritual, non-religious sorcerer is trying to speak up against him and making fun and contradicting and arguing with everything Paul says. Finally, look at this. Then Saul, also called Paul. I had to get down to that verse because I had to explain. Now, now I can call him Paul for the rest of the sermon. Saul, who's also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elymas and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Saul has had it up to here with this guy. And he decides, I'm done. And look at this. He's got such boldness. First of all, apparently Paul did not take a Dale Carnegie course. This is not how to win friends and influence sorcerers. Okay. But he's bold to speak up for Jesus. Now, bold to speak up for Jesus, but there's another half to that equation, right? Power to back it up. Look what he says. Now the hand of the Lord is against you, and you are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Oh. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking for someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. Well, no doubt. Paul just said, you're going to go blind, and he did. Yeah. That's crazy. Some of you are like, ooh. Ooh, there's a guy at work that I'm thinking of. You know, there's a person in my... That, that's not the point. The point is not that you'd be able to beat up your enemies. The point is not, oh, I've got some people I'd like to make go blind. That's not the point. The point is, this man was resisting Jesus. And Paul says, you are resisting the will of God. He's got power and boldness to call it what it is and power to back it up. And people start getting saved. Starting with this proconsul. They travel, and I'm not going to, now I'm, I'm about to preach through, I'm about to preach through from here, from Acts 13 to Acts 28 in the next few minutes. Are you ready? Okay, if you've got a Bible, you're going to want to get a hold of it, okay? <laughs> Paul starts traveling, focusing almost entirely on cities. He goes, I wish I, I wish I could pull up a map for you right now of the ancient world of, of Greece and, and northern Africa and Italy and Sicily and the Mediterranean Ocean and all of, these, uh, all of these parts of the world where Paul starts traveling and he starts going around the ancient world focusing largely on cities, influential trade route cities. And he starts going and preaching and he stands up everywhere he goes and says, I've got good news news for you. You are going to lose your soul because you're following false gods. But Jesus, the Son of God, has come, has died on the cross, has risen from the dead for your sin. And if you'll repent of your sin, He, when He comes back to judge the living and the dead, He, will for, he has forgiven you and He will take you with Him to be with God in heaven forever. And by the way, that's really good news and that's the gospel. That's what we believe. I know it might sound a little bit foolish. But Paul in Romans chapter 1, in one of his letters, he writes this in Romans chapter 1. He said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Amen. Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone that believes. I realize that, this, that what we believe could sound a little bit foolish. I realize that. I know. It could. So, wait, you're saying that God had a son. God had a son, and he was God, but he became a man, but he was still God. 
So he was God and man at the same time. And then he lived such a perfect life that they killed him. And then three days later, he came back to life again. And he came out of the grave and he went up to heaven. And now he's coming back on a white horse. Yeah. <laughs> you want to come too? That's essentially what the gospel is, isn't it? This is the message. I realize that could sound foolish, but listen to me. This is why Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It sounds like it could be something you could be ashamed of, but he says, I'm not ashamed. You know why? You know why Paul's not ashamed? He has watched it change lives. Yes. He has watched it take drunkards and make them sober and make addicts and take addicts and make them clean. Yeah. He has watched it take adulterers and make them faithful. Yeah. He has watched it take broken lives and fix them up and make them worthwhile. Yeah. It is the power of God unto salvation for everyone that believes. So Paul goes to all of these places. He goes to all of these cities and starts preaching the good news. And while he's there, he goes through terrible, horrible, difficult times. In fact, in, in these different ones, in these different places, he is he's stoned. Uh, he is uh, beaten. In fact, in, in Acts chapter 14, first the crowd thought he was a god because he healed someone. And they're like, oh, the gods have come down to us as mortals. In this city in Acts chapter 14, there was a legend. There was a legend of a, of a, ma of a, a man who, a man, an old man and his wife, who two gods came down. And they visited the Greek gods, the old legend said. The Greek gods came down and they visited this city and no one would let them stay for the night. But this old man and this old woman in a small humble hut let them stay and gave them some food and let them stay for the night. So they killed everyone else in the city and turned their house into a palace. That's the old, that was the old legend that, it, that was in this city. So when Paul and Barnabas come in, they come into this city that has all this superstition, all this background, and all this, oh, the gods are going to come get us someday. If the gods come back, you know, we're grilling steak, okay? We're, we're not going to make the same mistake those people made in that story. So Paul heals this person, and they say, oh, the gods have come down to us as mortals. But instead, Paul and Silas say, no, 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 no. In fact, they, they run out into the crowd when they realize they're about to worship them. They run out into the crowd and they say, no, 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 not to us. You don't worship us. Worship only God. This is the kind of broken spirituality they encounter everywhere they go. Right after that, in the same place, in the same place, some Jews came down and made them, the same people, turned them against Paul and Barnabas, and they stoned them. Not that much longer, there's, uh, there's just all kinds of more, as Paul goes on another missionary trip, there is all kinds of more problems. In fact, let me read to you Paul's account of it from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You don't have to go there, but I'll read this to you. He, in a very personal letter to one of the churches, here's what he said about what he been through. Verse 23 of chapter 12, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Now if you know the ancient world, they thought 40 lashes with the Roman whip would kill someone. Like they, Normally they don't survive. If you get 40 or up, you don't live through it. And so what they would do is give someone they really wanted to hurt, they'd give them 39. Like we want to take you right up to the edge of dying, make you hurt as much as possible without actually killing you. And Paul said, they did that to me five times. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a day and a night in the open sea, apparently before he was rescued. I have been constantly on the move. You can imagine. If they're looking for you that much, you're sneaking from house to house. Don't tell me following Jesus is not exciting. <laughs> it can be exciting, all right. He's sneaking from house to house, living constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled 
behold, and often I have gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Paul is a whirlwind of powerful spiritual activity and simultaneously gets beaten half to death for it on so many fronts. This is why, this is why I kind of laugh at these TV preachers. Oh, I'm so full of the Spirit, I'm going to hold a great... Uh, fill up, I'm going to fill up a stadium with people and we're going to do all of these... Show me your scars, right? <laughs> That's, uh, Paul says, here's my proof. Here's my proof that I know God. Here's my proof that I'm a powerful, powerful apostle and Christian. Look at what I've been through. So Paul goes on. He plants churches and cities, which, by the way, is why our church believes in planting churches. That's why we helped plant the church in Clovis, New Mexico, Servants Heart Chapel. That's why we're in discussions about planting a church in Nebraska currently. That's why we're working together with the Alabama Church Expansion Committee to try to actively recruit and find places to plant churches. We're in discussions about planting a church in Charlotte. You know why? Because in these cities, in these cities are millions of people Jesus died for. There's a reason why, there's a reason why people tend to not like living in the city. Sometimes even people who have to live in the city don't like living in the city. Right? Because it's not always a good place to live. There's lots of brokenness there. There's lots of crime there. There's lots of concern and, and, and hurt and pain there. But Paul goes right into the teeth of it and says, I've got a message that can change everything. So he goes, and this, the rest of this book reads like a march that is unstoppable. It reads like a march. You can't possibly stop Paul on his march. You can't stop the church of Jesus Christ. They try to stone him in Acts chapter 14. They try to beat him uh, in Acts chapter 16. They do beat him in Acts chapter 16. They throw him in jail in Acts chapter 16. They put him in, in prison. They beat him and they fasten him and Silas. Now he's got a new traveling companion named Silas. They've got it. They fasten his hand, their hands and feet in the stocks. You know what stocks are? Anybody ever seen stocks? You know what they are? Right? Those things where you put your head and your hands through and sometimes your feet through and they clamp down on you so you can't move. They put their feet and their hands in the stocks. And they leave them there all night long. And Paul and Silas, well, they start, they start crying. And they say, Lord, you're just not being fair to us. We're trying our best to serve you, Jesus. And here we are, stuck. I thought you had something better for this. Where's the Cadillac I thought I was going to drive? Where's my 401k? It's gone down. I just thought that serving Jesus was going to be better than this. No, they don't. Chapter 16 of Acts. In fact, if you want to look, verse 25 is where we're at. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. They're doing what? They're singing. It's midnight. I'm hurting for Jesus. I can't sleep. Let's sing. Let's sing praises to the one I'm bleeding for. Let's sing praises to the one I'm hurting for. And look at this. Suddenly, verse 26, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, the prison, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. Yeah. This was some earthquake. Yeah. Yeah. When your chains fall off the prisoners, yeah. that's a God earthquake right there. Yeah. Let me tell you, there is no situation in your life so bad that if you won't praise God, if you'll praise God, he's not able to do something about it. There's no situation that bad. 
If you will give him honor and glory and praise in the middle of your pain and in the middle of your trials, God is able to send an earthquake in your life. A good kind of earthquake that pops open the doors and the chains fall off. And this is what's amazing. At the, the jailer woke up. Okay, the earthquake. Oh, earthquake, earthquake. He looks and he sees the prison doors are open. And he knows what's coming because if all the prisoners escape on his watch, he's dead. And so it says here, he drew his sword and he's about to kill himself. He knows I'm dead anyway. I'm just going to die right now. I'm not going to give him the privilege of going through the process of torturing me. I'm just going to die right now. But when Paul, but Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself. We're all here. Now wait a minute. Everybody's chains fell off and they were all there. Here's what I think. I think that all the prisoners in that jail knew something was up. I think they knew, this is the original jailhouse rock, okay? I think they knew, thank you, that was, yeah, that's my one Elvis joke for the day. We'll move on now. <laughs> I think they knew that something really major was going on. God was in this. Their chains fell off and they didn't run? I think they wanted to figure out what was happening next. Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas are praising God and there's an earthquake. The jailer's about to kill himself. Don't hurt yourself, he said. We're all here. And the jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He heard the singing too. He knew what they were there for. He fell trembling before Paul and Silas and he, he brought them out of the jail and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? saved. And classic, classic, powerful verse here. Listen to me. Listen to me. When you come to the end of yourself and it looks like there's nothing left for you. Everything is gone. Everything is done. It's all over. I might as well end it all right now because I can't see any reason to keep on living. When you come to that place, if you'll tune your ears and listen, God will bring back some songs that these people around you have sung. And he'll bring back a handshake from somebody that cared about you in this church and he'll bring back some words from this little loud preacher and he'll say don't you give up don't you hurt yourself we're still here we're still here and if you'll at that moment fall on your knees before God and say God what do I need to do to be saved he'll save you and he'll change your life and you'll never be the same again some of you have tried it before you said, yeah, I tried that before. No, you didn't. You tried religion. You tried religion. That's what you tried. You tried being a good person, turning over a new leaf, showing up at church once a week. I don't know if you have tried falling on your knees before God and saying, I can't save myself. i got to be saved. Help me. Yeah. If you do that, there would be some action in your life. And you know what happens? Paul says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You and all your household. So they preach to him. He gets saved. He goes home, gets his family. And in the middle of the night, he takes Paul and Silas home with him, cleans the wounds on their back, bandages them all up. They preach to his family. His family gets saved. They all get baptized. It's incredible. And it says here, the jailer, after he brought them into his house, set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God. He and his whole household. Yes, Lord. Beautiful. Yes. Paul keeps marching. 
The march continues. He moves on to Thessalonica in Acts chapter 17. He's only there three weeks because of persecution. He has to get out of town because he's literally in danger of being murdered again. He gets out of town. There's a riot behind him. He moves on. He moves to Berea. He goes on to Athens, the culture center of the Greek-speaking world, the old Alexander, Alexander the Great time with all the great philosophers. That's Athens, right? He goes there, and unfortunately he's stuck there without his church planting team. They got separated from them. I don't have time to tell the story. He got separated from them, but he's so passionate about this, he goes just goes into the marketplace and starts talking to people about Jesus. He didn't even have his team with him. He can't even plant a full church, but he just goes in and starts preaching in the marketplace and talking to people. And people hear it and they take him to the Areopagus, which is like this big philosophical gathering of all the minds. It's the meeting of the minds in Athens. And he goes there and he preaches. And a few of them, most of them mock. Most of them mock. But a few are curious and they say, we'd like to hear more about this, this Jesus who rose from the dead. We'd like to hear more about this. I love this. Listen to the end of his message in Acts 17. Therefore, he says, since we are God's offspring, okay, we're, all, we're all made in the image of God, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. You push pause and say, are there idols in our culture? Now, I know there are in other cultures, right? Right, there are, other, there are idols like people bow down to, you know, uh, a Buddha or other false gods in other cultures in India or in Africa someplace. Or, I know that. But are there idols in our culture? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there are. We might not make them out of gold and silver and stone, or maybe we do sometimes, right? You want to see some idols? It doesn't take long. You drive down, drive downtown Oklahoma City, and you'll see them, one with a big 35 on his chest, right? <laughs> Plastered up on the side of the Chesapeake Arena. Am I saying Kevin Durant's evil? I'm not saving Kevin. I'm not saying Kevin Durant's evil, okay? I'm not. I promise. Here's what I am saying. That if you replace Jesus with anything else, that becomes an idol in your life. And anything can be an idol. There's nothing wrong with gold, but if you shape it into something you worship, that becomes an issue. And he says, don't think that God is like these other things. There are lots of idols in our culture. There's, there's money, right? Some of it looks like George Washington and Benjamin Franklin, little green pieces of paper. That's some people's idol. Is anything wrong with money? No, I'm in favor of it. You need it to live. But if you take it and make it God, it's an idol. And he says, don't, you ought to think that God is like any of these things. Instead, look at this. He says, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance. You ever wondered why God didn't just blast people who were evil in the the past. It's because he's patient and merciful. That's why. The same reason why you're not in hell. The same reason why I'm not in hell. That's why. That's why he was patient with those people. But look at this. He says, in the past God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man that he has appointed. That's Jesus. And he has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. My friends, Jesus rose from the dead. He's alive and well. And he's coming back and he will judge the world. And your sin, your hidden thing that no one else sees, your thing that the Word of God says is wrong, but the culture around you doesn't believe believe is wrong and your family doesn't believe is wrong so you keep right on doing it that thing you will stand someday before God and be judged for that and on that day what will you say everyone else was doing it on that day, what will you say? Well, my mom taught me that. I saw my dad do that. I didn't have a dad. I didn't have a mom. I didn't. What are you going to say in that day when you stand before the judge of all the earth? And he who knows everything you have ever said, done, or thought 
When you stand before Him, what are you going to say? Do you see why we must tremble before the Lord and say, what must I do to be saved? Because on that day, there is no one to save except Jesus. And that's the good news of the Bible, is that Jesus can save and forgive and restore and make holy that which was evil. Yeah. <sighs> some heard about the re- when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, others said, "We want to hear you again." And some became followers and believed. He goes on to Corinth. Mixed up, messed up city. In Corinth, there's a hill called Acrocorinth up above the city. On the top of that hill, there is a temple to the goddess Aphrodite, the, the, the Greek, old Greek Roman goddess of love and sexuality. And at that temple of Aphrodite, the historians tell us there were a thousand temple prostitutes. On that hill, people would climb to worship and they would engage in sexual activity with those professional temple prostitutes. And that, that place, they believed that if the gods saw this as part of their worship, it would rain and the crops would grow. That's what they believed. You say, whew, that's all messed up. You know what? I hate to break it to you, but our culture is just about that messed up today in some ways. The truth is, the truth is that today people still view sexuality as God. Not as a gift, but as God. It's the ultimate thing. It's the one thing you can't live without. It's what you got to have more than anything else. It's what we think about and talk about. And, and you don't believe me? Did you know that pornography, pornography, more money is spent on pornography every single year than the NBA, the Major League Baseball, the NFL, and Major League Hockey combined. All those people in all those stadiums and all those jerseys they sell that people wear around town and all that official wear and all those tickets and all those luxury boxes, more money is spent every year in pornography in America than on all those things put together. And that doesn't even count what's free. 12% of all websites are pornographic. All websites. The most Googled terms in our culture are terms related to pornography. Now, what am I saying? I'm saying, we're Corinth. We just keep it in our browser instead of on a hill above the city. But Paul goes into this town, literally in the shadow of a thousand prostitute temple and starts preaching the gospel and starts preaching you, you, and you and all of your your sin, your sexual sin, your, your sex outside of the bounds of marriage, all of this will be judged by God someday. But He has sent His Son Jesus who died on a cross, rose again on the third day and when He comes again, your only hope is to turn from your sin, follow Jesus now. And Paul begins to change a city. God begins to change a city through Paul's preaching. It's powerful. Amazing things. In fact, uh, he, Paul is intimidated and frustrated by that city in some ways because it's so wicked. And look at verse 9 of chapter 18. He says this, One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, Do not be afraid, he said. Keep on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. You know what he's saying? God says, Paul, stick around. I'm working. I'm working. I got people, I've got my hook in their jaw. 
I've got people I'm pulling on. You keep preaching, I'll bring in the harvest. You keep telling the truth, I'll bring the people to church. You keep speaking what is right, I'll lift up the name of Jesus in, every, in this place. And so Paul stays there for a, like a year and a half. He's preaching the good news. He keeps on going, and I've got to, I've got to speed up because I've got to make it the rest of the way through the book of Acts today. Here we go. He goes to Ephesus. He stays there about three, three and a half years. Major trade routes come through Ephesus. People from all over the ancient world crisscross through Ephesus. And he stays there about three and a half years. And little churches spring up in the towns all around there. So literally we have guys like Epaphras that we learned about later who comes to, Cor who comes to Ephesus, gets saved under Paul's preaching, then goes back and plants a church in a little town called Colossae. And we have the letter called Colossians in the Bible because Paul, who never went to Colossae, wrote a letter to that church to encourage them. It's amazing stories. There's a riot in Ephesus and, the, and, and like 20,000 people flood into the amphitheater there in Ephesus, the huge theater in this big city. 20,000 people shouting and screaming about their God. And Paul says, oh look, 20,000 people screaming. Someone should go in and preach. They won't even let him. They drag him away and they say, no, 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 Paul, you can't go in there. No, you can't go in there. They'll kill you. They'll tear you apart, apart Paul. So they, they, they pull him away. He moves on through Macedonia and through Greece. He raises a man from the dead in the middle of a church service um, in, in Acts chapter 20. It's amazing and powerful. And then God calls Paul to go to Rome. He says, I want you to go to Jerusalem and then when you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be arrested. Now, how would you like it if God said, if God said to you, um, here's what I've got for you. First, you're going to preach, and you're going to have lots of hard times, and then you're going to prison. <laughs> Sounds like a great life, right? I, I'm, I'm going to preach, you're going to preach, and then you're going to go, gonna go over here, and they're going to arrest you, and that's okay, because I've got a plan. So, Paul just obeys. He follows the Holy Spirit. He goes through on the way to Jerusalem in tw chapter 21. He arrives in Jerusalem. While he's there, he's arrested. He stands up and he preaches to the crowd in Jerusalem. And they get so angry, they try to tear him apart. Literally try to tear him limb from limb. And a Roman soldier, a group of Roman soldiers gather around him, push the crowd back, and literally carry him to go see the governor of the area because they're afraid the crowd's literally going to rip Paul apart part. So Paul goes, he meets with the governor, he comes and stands in, in chapter 23, he, he stands and preaches the good news before the, the, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council. Are, are you tracking with me? Paul's getting in front of a lot of big players, isn't he? He's hurting, he's arrested, but he's getting to preach in front of some big names, some big, some big people who need to hear the good news. So the plot, a plot develops to kill Paul. They transfer him to Caesarea. He goes in front of Felix, the governor. While Felix is hearing him, he invites another guy to come and listen. And another guy comes and listens uh, to uh, the uh, Herod Agrippa comes and King Agrippa comes and listens. Another man named, another governor named Festus, he's in jail for so long that the governor changes. Okay, like the political administration changes. And he gets to preach in front of a guy named Festus, another governor. Then, at the end of that, they will not let him go. He preaches, he says, look guys, I haven't done anything worthy of being arrested. I haven't done anything worthy of death. All I've been doing is preaching and I should be allowed to, to, to preach and teach freely. Finally, they say, uh, Paul, uh, the guy says to them, says to Paul, would you, would you be willing to go back to Jerusalem and stand trial? Paul knows if he goes back to Jerusalem, it's done. And he says, no, I don't need to stand trial before the Jews. You should be the one to set me free. But since you won't do it, he said, I appeal to Caesar. Now, anybody know who Caesar is, right? You know who Caesar is. Uh, the ruler of every, he does not the guy that owns the pizza place down here on Walker, okay? That's not him. It's a different guy. He says, he says, I, I want to appeal to Caesar. Now, Paul is a Roman citizen. Not everybody in those days were Roman citizens. Some of them were slaves. Paul's a Roman citizen. 
And when a Roman citizen appeals his case from a governor level and says, I'm appealing to Caesar, Roman law said if he, that if his appeal should be granted and he had to go and stand and make his case to Caesar. So Paul gets on a boat and sails for Rome under guard, sails for Rome. And this is where we kind of wind up. As we get to Acts chapter 28, there's amazing stories about a shipwreck and all sorts of things in the middle. But as we get to chapter 28 and verse 11, we see this. After three months, we put out to sea in a ship that had wintered on that island. Verse 12, we put in at Syracuse and stayed three days. Luke is a very careful, uh, detailed sort of guy. From there, we set sail and arrived at Regium. The next day, the south wind came up and we reached Puteoli. There we found some brothers and sisters and they invited us to spend a week with them. And look at this. And so, we came to Rome. This is like a triumph cry. This is like the capstone of the book. A little, do you remember where we started just a few minutes ago? There were 120 scared, poor, politically not connected believers in a little room crying out to God saying we've got to be full of the Holy Spirit. We've got to be. And God answered. And His church stayed full of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes through refilling times. Maybe you need one of those in your life. Maybe that's where you're at. Maybe you've leaked out spiritually. And it's time to say, God, you've got to refill me. I, I had more at one time than I have now and I'm not okay with what I've got right now. But they, whatever it takes, they stay full of the Holy Spirit. And the march continues. And this, the end of this chapter is basically 30 years. 30 years after Paul, uh, 30 years after Jesus went back to heaven. And from that little 120 people that God poured out His Holy Spirit on, there are tens of thousands of Christians. Thousands of little churches all across the ancient world. And the greatest missionary and preacher of the day is waiting in a rented house, it says. They let him stay in a rented house. Well, rent his own, you can rent your own place. And they kept a guard at his house. But Paul is, they didn't stop anybody from coming to visit him. And he's preaching and teaching in Rome, waiting to preach to Caesar in 30 years. How does that even happen? How do you go in 30 years from 120 people who have nothing to spread all over the world? The power and the boldness of the Holy Spirit. That's how that happens. And so... I look at this. In fact, I, I got one more thing I got I to tell you. In, in the book of, in the book of, uh, of, of Philippians, while Paul's in jail in Rome, he writes a book, he writes a letter to the church at Philippi called Philippians. And in that book, he says this, All God's people here send you greetings. They're in Rome. All God's people here in Rome send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Thirty years, 120 people scared to death in Jerusalem. And now there are people in Caesar's family who believe. That's incredible. That's not supposed to be able to happen. They didn't have what we have, right? They didn't have the conveniences that we have. They didn't have the mass marketing. You know what they did have? The power of the Holy Spirit. And if I have preached this whole, serv this whole series, and you are not hungry to be full of God, I have failed. If I have preached this whole series, and you are not hungry to be full of the Holy Spirit, then I've wasted my time and yours too. 
But if I've preached this, and down in you somewhere has been born a hunger to be so full of God that everywhere you go, you're bold to speak up for Jesus. I'm not talking about being mean or cruel or angry. I'm just saying nothing can stop you. At work, I speak for Jesus. At school, I speak for Jesus. At the store, speak for Jesus. At the gym, speak for Jesus. At home, speak for Jesus. If somewhere in you there is a hunger to be so full of God, like that, then this series has done what it was supposed to do. Because I read this book and I say, Oh God, I'm not like that. But I want to be. I'm not like this. I can't... I, I Sometimes I, I chicken out. But I want to be like that. Sometimes I feel like maybe, maybe God wants me to say something, but I don't... I don't. Sometimes maybe I feel like God ought to heal this person, but I don't say anything. Sometimes maybe I feel like God wants to do that, but I don't say anything. I'm just telling you that in the, in the heart of this preacher is a hunger that says, Oh God, make me like that. Make me full of God in a city that's dark. In a city where drugs rules the south side. In a city where criminals so often get away with it. In a city where broken homes is kind of the norm. In a city where abuse and foolishness and all kinds of things take place. God, make me so full of you that I shine like a light in a dark place. Would you bow your heads with me?